Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, which is the first in a series of events exploring the topic of hidden challenges in eating disorders during Eating Disorders Awareness Week 2022. My name is Barry Murphy, and I'm the Research and Policy Officer with BodyWise. This event is brought to you by BodyWise, the Eating Disorders Association of Ireland. This event features a live presentation. Throughout, you can sit submit your questions and comments through the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. At the end of the presentation, we will hold a live discussion and we will try to get as many to as many of your questions as possible. If you are tweeting, please use the hashtag EDAW2022 and make sure that you tag us at BodyWise. We will do our best to keep the time and hopefully it will run as smoothly as possible. Can I please remind you not to share your attendee link with others? We are recording this event and the recording will be made available publicly. Now, without further delay, I'm delighted to launch proceedings and welcome our guest speaker, Dr. anne Frederic Niveau. So she is a consultant psychiatrist who finished her master's in psychiatry in 2004. She worked in France as a practicienne hospitalier and in child psychiatry and for the World Health Organization before joining the research department in Trinity College Dublin in 2011. She has been a lecturer in France since 2004 and has also joined the College of Psychiatrists of Ireland in 2012. She currently works for the Health Service Executive in Ireland as Head of Service in Summerhill Adult Mental Health Centre Wexford and as Clinical Lead for Liaison Psychiatry in Wexford General Hospital. Since 2016, she has been developing in collaboration with the paediatric team in Wexford General Hospital and the University Hospital Wexford, Waterford, an outer of our emergency service for young people with mental health issues. She has published many articles and is part of several editorial boards and psychiatric associations. In 2020, she became a me member of Universal Scientific Education Research Network, USERN, and a supervisor in the NEMA group. In 2020, she collaborated with the HSC and RT Television to deliver some informative videos about health. And Anne, you're very welcome this morning. I'm going to hand over to you now, please. Can you see my screen? All good. Yeah. Okay, all right. So, let's get this. Um, Okay, so my name is a, oh, just a sec. Okay, so my name is Anne Frédéric Navio and I'm a consultant psychiatrist. I currently work in Wexford. And today I wanted to talk about RFID, which are avoidant or restrictive food intake disorder. Um, just a second, I can't. So this is the plan of my presentation. We're going to start by some uh, clinical cases, and then we will talk about the theory. So the first clinical case is about a twelve-year-old girl called Alaya, whom I've met in hospital. She was living with her mom and dad. She was described as a high achiever pupil, quite popular, lots of friends, lots of hobbies, and really enjoying gymnastics. She explained that she always wanted to be the best and was even sometimes putting herself under pressure in order to achieve this. In the family or even on a personal point of view, there was no medical or psychiatric history. Alaya had two older half siblings on her mom's side, but in the family, everybody was worried because she was not eating and she was losing weight. So Alaya went with her parents to her GP, who sent her to AME for severe constipation. When she arrived in the hospital in AME, she was prescribed some Movicol, but unfortunately, two weeks later, she had lost two kg. There was a deterioration in her. She could not eat solids. She was vomiting after solids and she had absolutely no appetite. She was able to drink water, but was complaining of nausea and cramps in the belly. 
She had no energy. There was a severe constipation, dizziness, crushing fatigues, and multiple aches. So she was admitted to the pediatric ward. On medical examination and on multiple tests, everything came back normal. And she was then referred to liaison psychiatry. During the psychiatric assessment, her parents reported that Alaya had always been a very fussy eater and uh, has suffered from constipation since infancy. Her BMI has always been below the 20th centile. And the parents insisted as well on the fact that Alaya could eat one food for a period and then moves on to another food. Alaya herself explained that she didn't like the smell of food and that she didn't like to eat surrounded by people, which was the case in the canteen in school. She had an irregular eating pattern because of her constipation. She would get constipated, so she would not eat for a couple of days, then start eating a little bit, then get constipated, and it would all start again. She also explained that she was afraid to eat because she was afraid she could get sick. She also had a traumatic event. While on Movicol, she experienced some liquid stool, some fecal incontinence, and soil herself in front of everybody during the gymnastic class. So she decided to stop gymnastic. There was no history of binge eating, no self-induced vomiting, no use of laxative, except the Movicol prescribed in A&E, no diuretics or diet pills. She also had no issue whatsoever regarding body image or weight. She had no psychiatric symptoms. Her presentation was then consistent with a diagnosis of RFIT. She was discharged from the ward and referred to the child psychiatry local services in order to start FBT, which is the family behavioral therapy. Unfortunately, two weeks later, Alaya had to be readmitted on the ward, even though she had not been seen by child psychiatry yet. She had deteriorated and her sleep was disturbed. Her weight had dropped again. So we then opted for a multidisciplinary approach with the pediatric team, the liaison psychiatry, and the dietitian. We also made a prudent referral for CAMS inpatient bed, and we were aiming for meaningful gains in weight and physical stabilization. The strategy was to increase appropriate feeding behaviors and decrease the maladaptive ones. Everybody had to be on the same page for consistency and sustainability of the results. And when I say everyone, it means not only the patient, but the family and the staff. So meal plans were established and reviewed weekly with the dietitian. Besides increasing the food intake, we also tried to introduce new foods for Alaya. We saw that her stress was decreasing progressively and at a stage, she was even making herself some suggestion in order to make her meal more comfortable. She had a one-to-one -one nurse beside her and psychiatric reviews were made systematically with a member of the pediatric team in order to keep everybody on the same page, but also to minimize the stress and reduce the medicalization to provide a neutral environment. So doing that, we plan and organize some gradual breaks from the hospital so that Alaya could go home and spend some time with her family, her friends, and her pets. With psychoeducation, parents feel more confident, quite empowered, and more comfortable to manage their daughter once they're home. The breaks are extended from a few hours when at home she goes for nights for several days. And we notice that the outings do stimulate her appetite and help to remain socially included. Parents at that stage are not keen on medication and she is discharged from the ward with a weight of 45 kg. Unfortunately, five months later, her weight dropped again and she has to be admitted for the third time in the hospital. At that time, Alaya disclosed constipation, nausea, abdominal cramps, mainly at night time. She also explained that she's not eating during the day, but that she's dying of hunger comes the evening. She described really bad sleep, saying that she's stressed in the morning with poor concentration. 
So at that stage, the parents were agreeable to start medication. She was started on mirtazapine with a progressive recovery and a multidisciplinary follow-up. A second clinical case is the story of Riyad, who is a six-year-old Irish girl who is living at home with her mom and dad. She also has a much older sister and a little brother. She's described as always being a fussy eater. She only eats a very limited range of foods, essentially processed food, and she likes to eat them at her grandmother who lives across the street. She goes to primary school in senior infant and is a big, big fan of horses. She was admitted on the pediatric ward after one week of refusing food and taking a reduced fluid intake. She had been removing food from her mouth with her fingers, but she had not been vomiting. She has also been seen exercising in her bedroom, and she says that she is afraid to choke, and also that her throat is very sore. On physical examination, weight, height, everything is normal, except that she required some IV fluids over the night. We also found some ketones in her urine in ED, which is totally consistent with a history of poor food intake. So the pediatric team at that stage asked the involvement of the dietitian and liaison psychiatry. Talking with the family, parents could not remember any traumatic episode that could have led her to be afraid of choking, apart from the fact that a few days prior to her admission, she had given a fruit jelly to her baby brother and he had slightly choked on it. There was no psychiatric history and no problem with body image. On the ward, she had no issues with drinking liquids, no matter what was in the liquid, but she was systematically refusing to eat solids. For example, she was more than happy to drink some 40 sip. Uh, in order to help her to eat, her parents went to McDonald's to buy her a favorite food and she was known to really like the chips from McDonald's, but on the ward, she was putting the chips in her mouth, sucking the salt and not swallowing the chips. So during the psychiatric examination, Riyad explained that she could not eat bits or chunks or any solid food. She said it started when her throat began to be sore and that it was because her throat is sore that she cannot manage eating bits anymore. And then it became really interesting because she gave a good chronology of events. She explained that it all started during Storm Barney where she had an episode of vomiting. It was nothing serious, but it marked her and she said that it irritated her throat. And then about two weeks prior to admission, she explained that she was sitting at the table trying to finish her meal, but then her dad and big sister were on their way out and she wanted to join them. So she wanted to finish her meal as quickly as possible. She was eating happy faces and she stuffed all the happy faces that were on her plate inside her mouth. And then it got stuck in her throat. At the same time, because she was trying to finish her meal so quickly, she was not drinking anything. So she felt very unwell and had to rush to the toilet downstairs and remove the contents of her throat with her fingers. She said that from that moment, her throat got really sore and she could not eat any solid food anymore. Or if you were to give her solid food, just like her chips, she would suck them and put them back on the plate. Mom said she had totally forgotten about this, but that indeed afterwards, Riyad would not have happy faces anymore, even if cut in tiny bits. And then finally, she reported the episode where the little brother choked on the fruit jelly that mom had already mentioned. So Riyad had also been reported caught exercising by her big sister. So at that stage, there was an hesitation with if it's anorexia. But she explained that she had been doing so because her favorite thing in the world are horses and that she would love to learn to ride. She was told that she needed to be fit and strong in order to go to the riding school. And so she decided to exercise and get ready for that course. 
She had no worry whatsoever about her body shape, her body image, nor her weight. She was afraid just that her throat would get stuck again if she was eating bits. So while she was on the ward, Riyad agreed to try some solid food. And there was a suggestion to use Diflam, which is a local acting analgesic and anti-inflammatory, in order to numb her throat and help her to face her fear to eat bits. We also requested a follow-up as an outpatient in a multidisciplinary environment with pediatry, dietitian, and child psychiatry. And there's still a lot of work to do with that little girl. So if we need to define a RFIT, let's say that avoidant restrictive food intake disorder is a concept that was described for the first time in 2013 in the DSM-5. It was previously referred to as a selective eating disorder. RFIT is at the crossroads of eating and feeding disorders. It can be an umbrella diagnosis as it covers a large and heterogeneous list of eating symptoms. And so far, there's no clear guidelines regarding diagnosis and treatment. It's a new diagnosis that defines individuals who have symptoms that do not match a traditional eating disorder diagnosis, but do experience clinically significant struggles with eating and with food. It's an eating disorder or a feeling disturbance that is characterized by a persistent failure to meet appropriate nutritional and or energy needs. People with RFIT are not getting a wholesome diet due to the complication of our feet and because it forces them to have a very limited interaction with food. An inadequate nutritional or caloric intake can be leading to an unintentional weight loss, nutritional deficiency, a dependence on supplement or on terror feeding and or significant impairment regarding psychosocial feel. The DSM-5 made very clear that RFID could only be diagnosed in the absence of weight or shape concern. At the same time, it has been noted that though patients with RFID may experience poor body image related to being visibly smaller in height and or in weight compared to some same age peers. RFID symptoms vary widely and can evolve with the development context of the individual. A person with RFID has some type of issue with eating, which can often stem from difficulty digesting specific foods, food avoidance to sensory issues, like various colors or texture of food that they can't stand, restrictive eating, eating small portion, little or no appetite, or fear-based experience, being afraid to eat after a frightening episode of choking, gagging, or vomiting. But there's also other qualities of life concerns that are difficulty with social interaction, social function, work or school responsibilities due to inadequate nutritional needs and co-occurring disorder. For example, some children would avoid eat uh, would avoid to eat in school because they don't like to eat surrounded by other children or because it takes too long for them to eat or because the context doesn't suit them. Um, we know that our feed is more common in children and young adolescents and less common but still existing in late adolescence and adulthood. It's often associated with a psychiatric comorbidity disorder, especially anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. Our feed is also more than just picky eating or fussy eating, and children do not grow out of it and often become malnourished because of the limited variety of food that they will eat. The true prevalence of our feed is unknown, Preliminary estimates suggest that it may affect as many as 5% of children. In the US, the rates of RFID are between 5 and 14% in the eating disorder program, and up to 22.5% in the day program for eating disorder. 
One of the statistics is that boys may have a higher risk for RFID than girls, as RFID tends to affect more males than females. Now, what is RFID due to? Some studies have shown that a major cause of RFID could be biological. Basically, they have identified three types of factors that are involved in generating RFID. There's genetic factors, psychological factors, and social cultural factors. Regarding the genetic factors, we know that eating disorders are family illnesses, and that temperamental traits predisposing individuals towards developing an illness are passed from generation to generation. And there's basically two ways to pass that information, either from a molecular point of view, or from an environmental influence. Some social cultural factors are to be considered too. Cultural pressure to eat clean, pure, healthy, as well as increased interest in food processing, sourcing, packing, and the environmental impact can influence food beliefs and intake. For example, a healthy appearance expectation in many culture and in society today, there is oftentimes a misconnection that looking thin is the equivalent of being healthy. And this is a common cause for anorexia nervosa, which can co-occur with RFI. Food beliefs are also important. Indeed, they can include moral beliefs about eating meat and dairy, or how these food items are prepared. In terms of psychological factors, there is anxiety and OCD, which are also a very often co-occurring disorder. Indeed, for many patients, symptoms of the RFID eating disorder can co-occur with OCD. And in some more extreme cases, obsessions with food intake or preparation can lead to ritualistic compulsions. Anxiety can be another cause of RFID, specifically in patients who experience anxiety or fear around eating. They may avoid eating out of fear that they will choke, vomit, or even die if they eat certain food. In terms of clinical presentation, um, I have decided to talk about RFID symptoms in children and compare them to uh, RFID symptoms in adults. In children, you will notice a lack of food interest, some fear-based food restriction, and a limiting food intake. In adults, you will notice also some fear-based food restriction, but very much so inflexible eating behavior. Indeed, when it comes to identifying RFID symptoms in adults, one common warning sign is inflexible eating behavior, which can be categorized as one being extremely picky with food selection. There is a clear distinction between food preference in healthy adults versus inflexible eating behavior found in RFID diagnosed individuals, including refusing to try different or new types of food extremely specific preparation of food choices and sensitivity to the sensory one perceives from a food, whether physical or emotional. These are fit symptoms evoke inflexible eating behaviors that can cause attitudes of anorexia nervosa or even bulimia. There's also a um, subcategorization of our fit first five types that have been identified, avoidant, aversive, restrictive, adult RFID, and RFID plus. So the group of RFID avoidant is basically the group where people avoid certain type of food, essentially for sensory reason. So they will only eat food that are white, or they will refuse to eat any kind of food that is not white, or that have such or such smell or texture, etc. The aversive group is uh, more about the people that have had a bad experience while eating and then afterwards don't want to try again the same food. 
You also have the restrictive group with a limited intake associated with poor appetite or limited interest in eating. It's also people who can say that they get full very, very quickly. Adult are fit, we've just talked about it. And regarding RFIT plus, it's basically a type of RFIT when the RFIT is co-occurring with uh, another eating disorder. We need to know that once established, a pattern of food avoidance can become long-standing and highly resistant to change. And this is causing a lot of health risk. First of all, a weight loss then some nutritional deficiencies, which are basically very similar to the one you would find in anorexia nervosa, some growth failure, some reliance on supplement or tube feeding, some eating problems with emotional disturbances, mealtime is becoming extremely stressful, for example, not being able to eat solid, a heightened fear of vomiting and or choking, sensory issues, a disturbance in the psychosocial functioning with a lower quality of life, avoiding social situation that involve food. And of course, mental health with repercussion, with low mood, irritability, anxiety, apathy, difficulty concentrating and social isolation. So how are we going to treat RFIT? Well, the goal of the treatment are first, a medical stabilization with a weight restoration, if it's appropriate, a stabilization on a psycho psychological and or a psychiatric point of view, a nutritional rehabilitation to correct deficiencies and eat food from each basic food groups, fruit, vegetables, dairy, protein, and grains feel more comfortable eating in social situations. But a key component of our fit treatment is continuous education of patients, parents, and staff. Everybody needs to be on the same page. The treatment ideally addresses the neurodevelopmental history of the patient, the internal and external motivator, as well as goals and value family dynamics and family involvement, a multidisciplinary treatment team, seamless treatment team communication, and a collaboration with the referring providers. Every treatment plan needs to be tailored to the patient and his family. In order to do that, we need to be learning how to cope with anxiety that is connected to eating or past traumatic food related incident. We need to address the impairment on a psychosocial point of view, but also the nutritional imbalance and the malnutrition. We need to expand the range of food consumed. We need an acceptance based in interoceptive and exteroceptive exposure treatment to understand bodily sensations and need but also building confidence outside of hospital for both families and the patient. The treatment for our fit can occur at all levels of care. It can be done as an inpatient in hospital or as an outpatient in consultation and at all the levels in between like a day hospital or partial hospitalization or residential stay. Recent studies have highlighted that various therapies are really useful in terms of RFIT. You have uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy for RFIT, and we're gonna talk about that in a little while, the family-based therapy, the parent-facilitated behavior treatment, supporting parenting for anxious children emotion adapted for RFIT, the space RFIT, the CBTR, and as it is advised on the website of uh, BodyWise, is something that you can even start and do at home. And on the website, you will find the, you will find the, the link uh, for the workbook, which is extremely, extremely well made. And the following uh, uh, slides are essentially taken from that workbook. So what does CBTR look like? 
Well, there's four stage to be reached over 20 to 30 sessions, knowing that sessions are happening at least once a week. Parents may need to attend this session depending on the age and the goals of the patient. And each week, patient will be given some kind of homework or some task to do at home. These tasks can be, for example, to keep a log of the food that you've eaten or to try and practice some new food at home. The four stages regarding the CBTR are first to learn about our fit and make early changes. Stage two, continue these early changes and set big goals, essentially increasing volume and or food variety. Three, facing your fears. And four, prevent relapse. In CBTR, you will first learn about new food by tasting small amounts of simple food and practicing this at home. And as you become more comfortable with these food, it is time to incorporate them into your meals and your snacks. As you continue to learn about more food, you will work on mixing food together and trying complex food. So this is, for example, another page from the workbook, which explains the strategies that can be used in order to incorporate new foods at home. You can fade it in. So you start with a high proportion of a preferred food in which you put a little bit of the new food. And then you gradually increase the proportion of the novel food while fading out the preferred food. You can add some spice, some dressing sauce, or some spices can change the taste. You can chain to a goal using a preferred food to chain a novel food. You can switch it up, meaning that if at first you don't succeed when you are trying a new food, you try again, but you can change it up. Try different presentation of novel food, like cooked versus raw, sorted versus unsorted. You can also deconstruct food. If you have never tried, for example, a, uh, a slice of pizza, well, you can uh, try start it with one component of the food and then add gradually the other ingredient one by one. For example, you try the crust alone, then the crust with some cheese, then the crust with cheese with tomato sauce, and finally, you will be able to try a full slice of pizza. We also talked about facing fears and a, um, one can wonder how does exposure work to reduce fears about eating? Well, it has been demonstrated that avoidance increases anxiety while exposure decreases anxiety. Indeed, avoiding a food that is scary is only a temporary solution. And the longer you're gonna avoid your anxiety, the more your anxiety will grow and the less you will feel you can cope with your fears. You also, by not tasting a food, you also miss the opportunity to see if you had very good reason not to eat it and if your fear are justified. And it's true that when you try a new food, initially you might feel quite anxious, but little bit by little bit, it will decrease, the anxiety will decrease as you keep practicing. The best way to overcome anxiety is to face your fears in a systematic way. Create a hierarchy of your fears from the one that is the least frightening to the most frightening. And one at a time, face your fears, evaluate whether your feared outcomes come true and watch what happens to your anxiety. Over time, you will probably see that your anxiety decrease and you will feel more confident in handling situations that used to be scary. I wanted to talk as well about the psychopharmacology that can be used and that has been studied in our feet. Now, the best clinical approach is always to focus on specific symptoms that may contribute to the condition and to identify and treat comorbid psychiatric conditions that may be exacerbating the patient's symptoms of food avoidance or restriction and overall distress. Concurrent anxiety disorder are the most prevalent, but depressive disorder is also common for patients with RFID. And as, pre as previously said, there's no established guidelines. 
Now the first aim need to remain by restoring a healthy weight for the patient and reducing the level of stress and anxiety connected to the fact to the food intake. Using a pharmacological agent should be carefully considered and associated to other treating approach, we've just mentioned different therapy and multidisciplinary intervention. Regarding the molecules that are used, some benzodiazepine like the lorazepam can be used in very low dose for extremely tense patients in the short term to reduce food related anxiety. For example, when you start a meal plan system just before giving the food, you might use a bit of benzo, but they are pretty addictive. The ciproheptadine is safe and effective for using young children with eating difficulties related to low appetite. The olanzapine, which is an antipsychotic, can also be used at low dosage, which is reducing anxiety, stimulating appetite, and facilitating the eating process in a young patient with RFID. The DC glossarin has also been used to assist in exposure intervention in anxiety disorder. The SSRI, which are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are antidepressants, are usually the first line of treatment for anxiety and depression, but because of some of their potential side effects, especially when you start taking them, they can make you feel nauseous, they can make you vomit or reduce your appetite, then they would exacerbate the difficulties that a patient with RFID is experiencing, and that could contribute or complicate the feeding and the eating issues. So that's not necessarily the first uh, line treatment when you have RFID. And the mirtazapine that we used in our first case presentation, mirtazapine is also a, an antidepressant. It enhances serotoninergic and noradrenergic neurotransmission, but it also has anticholinergic and antihistamine effects. Mirtazapine promotes appetite and weight gain. It decreases nausea and vomiting and improves gastric emptying. Mirtazapine is also improving sleep and reducing anxiety. So seen like that, it looks like it ticks quite a few boxes, but it remains an off-label approach with children. In conclusion, we can say that the complexity of RFID resides in its various presentations and aspects. Diagnosis and treatment must involve a multidisciplinary team and a polytherapeutic input to address these multiple facets. The pediatric treatment seems obvious, but so is the behavioral treatment, the dietetic approach, the mental health input, as well as individual family and group treatment everybody participating must be on the same page. And besides working with the patient, it is essential to also work with staff and family in order to reduce their own stress and provide a neutral environment in which the patient will work on restoring a healthy weight. Finally, train the trainer is essential for consistency and sustainability of the results. In the future, we hope that the research is going to help us understand some unknown factors. Indeed, currently little is known about effective treatments and intervention and the course of illness for individuals who develop RFID. There is limited research on the how and whether picky eating contributes to RFID. There is a lack of systematic data on the dietary characteristics of the disorder. Other unknown factors include the age at which RFID develops and whether or not it presents as a risk factor for later onset eating disorder. And in adults, research has already been suggesting that adults affected by achalasia, celiac sprue, eosinophilic esophagitis, and inflammatory bowel disease may also experience RFID. Thank you for listening. And it's uh... Thank you so much, Anne. And we have a couple of questions that have come in from the Q&A in the chat. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ellen. Okay. 
first question we got in was I got diagnosed with ARFID three years ago after being misdiagnosed with anorexia when I was 13. I'm just wondering, is there anywhere in Ireland that offers specialized therapy for ARFID? Well, I think it's often a, a difficulty, you know, when people develop some ARFID uh, and they go to hospital, you know, a lot of them would be initially, you know, diagnosed with anorexia, saying, well, it has all the signs except, you know, maybe the uh, concern about the, uh, the body image. And it's part of the differential diagnosis when you look at ARFID. Now about knowing a place where people uh, can have specific uh, treatment. I know that there was supposed to be some hops for eating disorder that the government had decided to, to, to put in place. Now, I work in Wexford, and we don't have any specific place. We try to work with the resources that we have, which is collaboration between the hospital, where you have a pediatric and a team and a dietitian and child psychiatry, but we don't have any dedicated place for treating our feet. Thank you. So the next question was, um, how do I get a two-year-old who has severe food allergies to trust food generally? He's allergic to eggs, nuts, fish, and is under investigations for more. This seems to cause his constipation to a certain degree. Oh, sorry, to a severe degree. Feeling frustrated in trying to help him, but he will not eat, and I'm still nursing him as he won't even drink water or milk. Many thanks for your help. Very interesting webinar. Uh it's a very good question as well. I think it's it will take a lot of patience and the uh, the workbook that is available on BodyWise might be really helpful in that regard because they suggest different strategies. Um, starting from, you know, when you face a food, trying to know the food, look what it looks like, smell what it smells like, uh, look at the color, the texture, in order to be more familiar with the food, and then, you know, try it in small quantities, um, and little bit by little bit increase the quantity, and uh, try to incorporate new food. Um, it, it's a whole process, and I think a dietitian might be of great help in that regard, in order to see, you know, besides all the, the food that the little baby is allergic to, which one could be tried and in which order. But indeed, that must be difficult. The next question is, can ARFID occur in the presence of weight gain and high BMI? Patient aged 16 has significant restricted variety in food and sensory issues with food. Yes. Uh, it can totally happen with a high uh, BMI. Um, it's uh, the, the, the diagnosis of our feed depends on the fact that the variety of food is extremely uh, limited. That there is a, a difficulty to eat what needs, you know, what would well to meet your uh, nutritional needs. And if you only eat, for example, certain type of processed food, you will be malnourished, but you might have a high BMI. So yes, you can have our feed and a high BMI. Thank you. And the last question I have here is, if you eat very little due to emotophobia, would that satisfy a diagnosis of our food? Yes. Yes, I, I would agree that the fact that you are afraid to, to vomit and uh, that because of that, you know, you avoid and you restrict your food, that is directly the definition of our food. Thank you. And I think Barry might have had a few questions himself, um, but that's all the questions that have come in through the Q&A box. Okay, thank you. There are a few more there that have come in, Ellen. So I'll I'm happy to drop in a few. Of us. So how can I ask you, and how then did you originally become interested in our food? Um, I used to work in France. I used to work as a child psychiatrist, and I've had a few cases over there. But at the time, it was not mentioned in the DSM. 
and it was difficult to find a label for that. Um, we were treating uh, these children, um, a lot of them had autism. Uh, I forget to mention, I was working for the Bon Sauveur Foundation, which specializes in children with a disability, especially autism. And we had to put in place some strategies to help them eat. Um, at the time, we were using basically a lot of similar strategies as for anorexia, knowing that it was a different disorder. Thank you. And is it kind of your experience that if someone has ARFID, is it, is it then hard for them to say, tell their friends about it and that kind of thing? Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I really think so. It is really hard and the uh, psychosocial impairment is real. You will have children that will refuse to go to a sleepover or a birthday party because if they go there, they will have to do like everybody or they're expected to do like everybody and they won't be able to you know a little bit like you will have other people with eating disorder that will avoid um, occasions where you know they will have to face food people with our feet will also avoid these circumstances yes thank you i know you mentioned a couple of times the idea of everyone has to be on the same page so kind of what, do, what does that look like in, in reality? Well, it means that when you treat, let's say, a child with RFID, it's good to talk to the child. It's good to talk to the parents, but it's better if everybody is on the same page. So having a talk where you have the child, the parents, but also members of the staff to say, well, now today, the big goal will be to try to, I don't know, increase uh, your portion of potato or something like that. And we all work on that. It is very important to include the, the parents. I was talking about train the trainer because in the end of the day, when the child will go home, the parents will be the one that will be looking after the child and that will have to do the job while in hospitals, sometimes, you know, it's just let's let the professional do the job, but the real professionals are the parents and they will be the one that we have to deal with that at home. Thank you. And I know something that comes up in eating disorders, it can be when is a person's personality changes. Is, is that something you would you would see in Narford too? Yes, the fact is that uh, there's a lot of mental health issues that are associated to eating disorders. And this is due to various factors. Um, one thing that is quite basic is that if you are malnourished, the chemistry of your brain does change and you might develop some mental health issues due to that chemistry change. Uh, if you have some eating disorder, uh, as mentioned earlier, you might avoid some psychosocial situation and then you find yourself isolated, quite lonely, and that can be the bed for some other mental health problem. Anxiety can also, well, especially in our fit, anxiety would probably be the, the, the biggest issue. Thank you. Alan, do you want to pick up on any more? If you've... Yeah, we have quite a few more questions. I'm not sure how many do we have time for. We'll get started anyways. So um, the next question was, uh, can you please let us know if there is anywhere in Ireland for specialized therapy or we do, do we have to refer to the UK for MDT support? Well, um, I, I'm not aware of a specific center that does treat our fit. I think it's just trying to work with the local resources. Um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people in, our, in Ireland are really well trained in order to, to give some help, but it's not the matter of one person, it's more the matter of a team. And I'm not aware of any team already organized and specialized in our fit, but I think in, you know, in Wexford, for example, the, the dietitian, the pediatrician and the uh, psychiatry team have been working together. 
but it was not a set team in the beginning. And as I mentioned earlier, I think there was some hub for the eating disorders that were supposed to be organized locally, but all of them are not organized yet. So. So the next question is, is there anywhere that deals with CBT for eating disorders that's not inpatient and would work with someone who is a BMI of 14? Um, I think CBT can be used and should be used uh, not only for inpatient, but essentially outpatient. I know that one of the criteria in child psychiatry is that they don't start doing, uh, well, in Wexford anyway, they don't start doing psychotherapy unless the BMI is at 16, because they consider that below that, you know, you can't focus enough on the, uh, the therapy. Um, now, I think you have nothing to lose trying it. Uh, but I, I don't know anybody specific. I would say the, the website BodyWise uh, is already giving a lot of example and kind of recipes and strategies in or that you can start at home. Um, but I don't know anyone who would be super specialized into that as a single person. The next question we have is, are there estimates of the prevalence of ARFID in autism? I, at the moment, there's only estimations and they, uh, it can be, well, the estimation go to as high as 5% of the general population. In autism, it must be much higher than that. But I don't have any any specific number. It's very controversial at the moment. There's different studies that have been made, but we don't have a global answer to that question. It would be higher than 5%. Um, another question we have, do you have any advice on how schools can support children with ARFID? Well, I think there's a lot of advice that can be given to educators. First of all, a being familiar with our feet and avoiding uh, force feeding. I don't know, I remember when I was in school, I uh, we could not leave the table unless everything was eaten. And I think it became very traumatic for a lot of people. So I think having an understanding and facilitating you know, the strategies would be, would be very positive. So maybe, you know, um, schools, might have, you know, an induction regarding eating disorders or things like that. So just in um, the amount of time that we have left, I'll just go with one more question, if that's OK. Um, so we have, I understand that ARFID can be caused by many factors. For those who develop a fear of eating due to choking, do you have an understanding of why some people would develop ARFID and some would not after going through similar experiences? Um, well, the, for some interoceptive and exteroceptive factors that I briefly mentioned in the description, uh, interoception is the perception of our own internal sensation. For example, the way we are aware that our heart is beating or that we are breathing. And it's different from one individual to another. And an event like choking can be really differently appreciated by different people. For some people, it will be something like an anecdote. For other people, it will be terrible and they will be marked. Now, I don't know um, how you would rate the intensity of the trauma, but it's true that if you take 10 people and you expose them to the same trauma, all of them are not going to react in the same way. Thank you, Anne. I'll hand over to Barry for some uh, closing remarks. Thank you very much, Ellen. And I suppose just to say that uh, the National Clinical Programme for Eating Disorders does acknowledge ARFID and in, in 2020, out of the 130 people who had an eating disorder 
eight percent at Arford. So that I think recognition is there that some people can access that service. But obviously, we know at the moment that there is still kind of a postcode lottery around parts of the country where not everyone, unfortunately, will have access to a specialist team and service for eating disorders. So I think that's everything for this morning. So I want to sincerely thank our speaker Anne for today's event. We will do the best we can to get this re recording up online as soon as possible. And please feel free to register for our next webinar, which is tomorrow evening, Tuesday, March 1st at 7 p.m., focusing on hidden challenges. And then there's another webinar on Thursday evening, also at 7 p.m., focusing on men's experience of eating disorders. And you can find details of each of these events on our website and social media. Thank you very much.